In Venezuela, presidential candidate for the Great Patriotic Forum and President Nicolas Maduro called for a great national front against fascism in view of the far right's violent actions. The Palestinian resistance movement Hamas withdrew from the ceasefire negotiations in Qatar following Israel's escalation of violence in Gaza. Russian armed forces reported the liberation of the locality of Uro Sainoye in Donetsk. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resource Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro called for a great national front against fascism in view of the far right's violent actions. The presidential candidate for the Great Patriotic Poll was welcomed by thousands of supporters in Guanare, Portuguese state capital. In this sense, the revolutionary candidate pledged to continue defending national sovereignty and the well-being of the Venezuelan people. Maduro also expressed his rejection to the intentions of the Venezuelan far right to govern the country with policies similar to those of the Argentine president Javier Milei. I extend my hand to all Venezuelans, to all neighbors, to unite in a great national front against fascism, against violence. I call from Guanar a great national front in defense of peace, of the economy, of democracy, against fascism, beyond what we are today. Let us unite all our great forces, all those who want freedom, peace, democracy and who do not agree with fascism and violence. In this regard, presidential candidate Maduro informed that the young leader of the opposition, former member of the Democratic Action Party, Carlos Prosperi, declared himself independent and announced his support to the candidacy of the Great Patriotic Poll. Today a young man I don't know if you saw the news. I was already on my way and they read me some news. The young leader Carlos Prosperi of the opposition declared himself independent, strongly criticizing the extremist right, denouncing the corruption of Waida, and all those people, and the plans of violence and Garimba, and said as of today I declare myself independent and announce my support for the candidacy of President Nicolas Maduro who is the only one who can guarantee peace and the full recovery of the economy. The United Socialist Party of Venezuela performs this Sunday the second national shake of the one times 10 times 7 machinery for the defense of the boards in the presidential elections on July 28th. The political organization informed the militancy the guidelines of the action plan established for these elections in which the installation of the three-color point in each one of the voting centers nationwide list of table of witnesses and the mobilization of voters through the units of Bado Hugo Chavez with the leadership of the one times 10 chiefs who must carry out house-to-house -house deployment in order to guarantee the victory. In Venezuela, Foreign Affairs Minister Ivan Hill received on Sunday the Prime Minister of the Republic of Belarus, Roman Golovchenko. Arrival of the Belarusian delegation marks the beginning of an agenda of productive work to strengthen bilateral relations. The Prime Minister Golovchenko is expected to visit the birthplace of the Liberator, among other solemn activities before the meetings. Caracas and Minsk established diplomatic relations on February 4, 1997. The solid alliance cemented by their governments has materialized through agreements in sectors as food production, energy education, air transportation, trade, petrochemicals, among others. In Venezuela, the native population representatives highlighted the achievements of the Bolivarian Revolution during the 17th session of the United Nations Export Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Vice Minister for Habitat, Lands and Communal Development, Mariani Romero, indicated that since 1999, the Bolivarian government built a legal and institutional framework to guarantee the rights of indigenous people. She also emphasized that as population, they are made visible 
and dignified by the Bolivarian Revolution as part of the plan of good indigenous government, which establishes a political, economic, and social model based on ancestral principles. The Bolivarian National Armed Forces provides border protection to indigenous communities, Mother Earth, and ancestral territories. On Sunday, U.S. President Joe Biden said that no motive was yet known for the assassination attempt on Donald Trump and calls on people not to make assumptions. Vice President Harris and I were just briefed in the Situation Room by my Homeland Security team, including the Director of the FBI, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, the Director of the Secret Service, my Homeland Security Advisor, the National Security Advisor, and we're going to continue to be briefed. The FBI is leading this investigation, which is still in its early stages. We don't yet have any information about the motive of the shooter. We know who he is. I urge everyone, everyone, please, don't make assumptions about his motives or his affiliations. Let the FBI do their job and their partner agencies do their job. I'm instructed that this investigation be thorough and swift, and the investigators will have every resource they need to get this done. The U.S. President detailed that the investigation is on its early stages and referred to the actions to be taken moving forward. As this investigation continues, here's what we're going to do. First, Mr. Trump is a former president and nominee of the Republican Party, already receives a heightened level of security. And I've been consistent in my direction of the Secret Service to provide him with every resource, capability, and protective measure necessary to ensure his continued safety. Second, I've directed the head of the Secret Service to review all security measures for the, all security measures for the Republican National Convention, which is scheduled to start tomorrow. And third, I've directed an independent review of the national security at yesterday's rally to assess exactly what happened, and we'll share the results of that independent review with the American people as well. Let's now take a look at updated figures on the scores of gun violence published by the Gun Violence Archive Organization in the United States. So far this year, 2024, 291 mass shootings have been reported in the United States. Among these, at least 16 massacres or mass murders have been reported, meaning events in which more than four people were killed. While the number of people killed in gun-related episodes amounted to 9,088, it is reported that 127 were children under 11 years of age and 636 were adolescents for a total of 763 minors. Palestine, the Hamas resistance movement will rose from negotiations for a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. The head of Hamas political bureau, Ismail Haniyeh, informed mediators, Qatar, Egypt and the United States, as well as regional participants of the decision. The announcement comes after Israeli bombardments killed 92 Palestinians in the Al-Mawasi refugee camp, 20 others in the Al-Shadi camp. However, the Hamas movement affirmed its readiness to resume negotiations when Israel shows a real commitment to conclude a ceasefire agreement and on the exchange of the hostages. Also in Palestine, Israeli occupation forces carried out four massacres in the Gaza Strip during the last 24 hours, leaving at least 141 people killed. According to medical sources, these actions also left close to 400 wounded. The health authorities warned that both figures could be even higher since many of the victims remain trapped under the rubble of the infrastructures affected by the bombings due to the Israeli impediments to the entry of ambulances and civil defense teams. According to the most recent health report, at least 38,584 Palestinians have been killed and 88,881 injured since October 2023 when the Israeli war against the Gaza Strip began.
Israel is holding more than 9,650 Palestinian civilians since the intensification of the siege on October 7, 2023. The Prisoner Society detailed that the figure includes people detained in their homes, others during illegal raids, in addition to those who surrender under pressure who remain as hostages of the occupying troops carrying out raids in the West Bank, Ramallah and Jerusalem during the last few days. At least 30 Palestinians were in prison, including women and several former prisoners. The government of Egypt has warned of the risk of a regional conflict escalation following the recent Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip. Egyptian authorities condemned the intensification of Israeli bombardment on densely populated areas in the Gaza Strip and reiterated their firm rejection of any restriction on Palestinian movements in their own territory. Also, they stressed the urgency of increasing the volume of humanitarian aid to Gazans and of agreeing on ceasefire. In recent days, Israeli forces targeted an area declared safe for refugees under the pretext of eliminating the head of the armed wing of Hamas, in which more than 90 civilians were killed and another 300 wounded. And in Israel, thousands of people marched once again to demand the resignation of the Najahu and an agreement that guaranteed the release of Israeli health in Gaza. Demonstrators marched for four consecutive days from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where they demanded the Israeli government to reach an agreement allowing the hostages from both sides to return to their families. The protests are held while Netanyahu insists on continuing the aggression despite internal pressures and the condemnation of the international community. My main demand is that the hostages return. But I also believe that, at the very least, Israel is committing heinous crimes in Gaza. And it's time to stop the war. It's time to remember that people are suffering on both sides. So that's my main demand. My concern is that in our government, some of the extremist people are stating that this is a good time to maybe put new settlements on the table so that Israelis can live in Gaza. And that to me is crazy. The Russian armed forces managed to liberate the locality of Urosainoje, located in the Donetsk region. The information was confirmed by the Russian Defense Ministry within the framework of the presentation of his daily report on the progress of the special military operation. According to the security agency, the losses of the Ukrainian forces on the various battlefronts amounted to about 1,785 military personnel. On the other hand, the Russian military destroyed more than 20 howitzers of British and Polish production, a self repository unit, and a U.S. made counter battery warfare station. In turn, the air defense system shot down 33 drones and 10 shells of the HIMARS multiple rocket launcher system. The Russian government has deemed as threatening a decision announced at the latest North Atlantic Treaty Organization summit. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said the resolution passed recently at the NATO meeting poses a threat to Moscow as the alliance has confirmed its intentions to eventually admit Ukraine. Peskov claims that in so doing, NATO does not contribute to diplomatic negotiations between the parties, or rather fosters hostilities against Russia by continuing to supply and provide military assistance to Ukraine. The United Nations Security Council has urged the parties in conflict in Sudan to de-escalate tensions. The UN Security Council is alarmed by the continuing violations of international law in Sudan and the heavy toll of the ongoing conflict on civilians, including women and children. The Security Council described the humanitarian situation and the food insecurity facing the country as serious and it called for making the best of the talks started in Geneva. Since April 2023, some 3.8 million people have been displaced as a result of the violence unleashed between the rapid support forces and the Sudanese army. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, at least 12 displaced persons lost their lives in the province of Ituri due to lack of living conditions, food and medicine. According to local authorities, the deaths were recorded in only four days in the sector of Mantali Kilo Yugu territory. This amidst the deterioration of the humanitarian situation in this mining town and the lack of means for medical assistance. The humanitarian coordinator for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bruno Lamarquise, 
made a statement on the matter calling on the authorities to work on solutions to ensure the gradual return of the 1.3 million displaced people living in the province after abandoning their homes to the violence of armed groups. On Sunday, July the 14th, France celebrated its National Day, or Bastille Day, which marks the day back in 1789 when the French people revolted against the monarchy by storming the Bastille Fortress in Paris, which in turn started the French Revolution. This year, the celebration was moved from its usual site at the Avenue Alone Les Champs de Lycée because of preparation for the upcoming Summer Olympic Games. This year, the celebration also marked the 80th anniversary of Liberation Day, the end of the Second World War, and the role played by U.S. troops in defeating Nazi Germany throughout Europe. At least white part of the parade this year included soldiers dressed in the military uniforms of the 1940s for both U.S. and French troops marching to such a big band era iconic tunes as Sing Sing Sing. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website testerenglish.net. So join us on social media. Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Tesla English, I'm with Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.